Previously, in probability in a nutshell, we used probability theory and combinatorics to derive the formula for the binomial distribution. There's more to be said about discrete random variables before going to continuous random variables. Suppose you want to toss 5 coins and count the number of hits that arise from these coin tossers. One possibility is that the first two coins turn up in hits, while the rest turn up in tails. There are many other choices of two coins from these five coins, and the total probability is the number of subsets of size 2 multiplied by the probability of obtaining the sequence of two hits and three tails. Suppose in this instance that the probability of obtaining hits is one quarter then the total probability of obtaining 2 hits out of 5 is 270 divided by 1024. We can summarize our results in the probability distribution table, but suppose instead we are only asking for the probability of obtaining 1 hit, then these are the possible choices of coins. Similarly, we can find the probability that there are no hits, the probability that there are 3 hits, the probability that there are 4 hits, and the probability that there are 5 hits. And since these are the only outcomes, we would expect their probabilities to add up to 1. And indeed, this is the case. But a more interesting question to ask is, if we repeat this experiment many times, what is the average number of hits? This is known as the expectation of the random variable, and it's counted by multiplying each outcome by its probability and adding them all up. This can be conveyed concisely using summation notation. In our previous example, we found the probability of obtaining a certain number of hits. This number could be 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, or 5. So to calculate the long-run average, we first take 0 times 243 over 1024 plus 1 times 405 over 1024, so on and so forth. Doing the calculation helps us obtain 1.25. And if we know that our random variable follows a binomial distribution, we know that the expected value must be the number of trials multiplied by the probability of success. One of the most important properties of expectation is the fact that it is linear. In other words, you can pull out constants and plus and minus signs without any issues. But another interesting question would be to ask, how spread out is the random variable? We'll define this quantity variance of x, which is defined to be the average of the squared error of the random variable from its average. There's a more useful formula than this. This is calculated by taking the average of the squares subtracted by the square of the average. To use this formula, we would calculate each outcome squared on top of each outcome, and we can calculate the usual average like before. Furthermore, we're going to calculate the average of the squares. We'll first take 0 squared times 243 over 1024 plus 1 squared times 405 over 1024 followed by 2 squared times 270 over 1024 so on and so forth. This number we obtain is 2.5. So to find the variance, we will plug in the average of the squared values subtracted by the square of the average value. This calculates to 0 0.9375. And just like expectations, variances have a really important property, where you can pull out the constants, remembering to invoke a square in front of them, and any plus or minus sign can get converted to a plus sign. This identity holds whenever x and y are independent. And just like before, if we know that x follows a binomial distribution, not only is the average the number of trials multiplied by the probability of success, the variance is also given by the number of trials times the probability of success times the probability of failure. In our example, 
the number of hits follows a binomial distribution because x counts the number of coin flips out of five that land up in hits. And we make a few assumptions in this calculation. Firstly, because the coins are essentially identical, the probability of success remains constant at probability one quarter. Secondly, the events that the coins land up in hits are independent from one another. This is justified since each outcome from each coin does not affect the outcomes of the other coins. But if we could have talked about discrete random variables, we could also talk about continuous random variables. The way we calculate probabilities involving continuous random variables is to draw its associated function and calculate the area between which the random variable lies. For example, the area between negative 1.5 and 0.5 is 0.625. This is precisely the definition of the probability that x lies in the region. As the boundary values change, the areas either increase leading to a higher probability or decrease leading to a lower probability. Furthermore, this curve is a very special curve called the normal distribution with mean 0 and variance 1. If we were to change the mean, the peak of the bell curve would shift accordingly to the mean. And if we were to change the variance, the curve would be more spread out than squished in, since variance measures the amount of spread in the random variable. The normal distribution satisfy a really important property. If we have two independent normal distributions, we can calculate their expectation using expectation properties, as well as their variance using variance properties. But what's even more fascinating is that the linear combination of these normal distributions must also follow a normal distribution, whose expectation and variance are what we calculated previously. In particular, if we have a random variable that follows the normal distribution with mean 3 and variance 2 squared, we can calculate the sampling distribution, where we take the arithmetic mean of n samples. This tells us that the sampling distribution also follows a normal distribution with mean 3 and variance 2 squared over n. And we used 3 and 2 as example numbers, but in principle, it could be any mean and variance we wished. But what happens if these samples are not normally distributed? We're going to flip 40 coins this time around, and the outcome of each coin could either be a hit or a tails. So in this first example, the first coin lands up in tails, the second coin lands up in tails as well, and rather unfortunately, the third coin lands up in tails as well. Interestingly enough, the fourth coin lands up in hits, but what we will do now is to tally up the total number of hits and divide it by 40. This tells us the average number of hits in one experiment. This number is 0.3, and we can add a piece at 0.3. We can repeat this experiment one more time and obtain the number 0.3 and we can add it on top of the layer previously. We can repeat this experiment multiple times. In this experiment, we are simulating 500 collections of 40 coin flips. And what's rather surprising is that these data points seem to follow a bell curve. In fact, we can roughly sketch the bell curve as follows. This actually helps us answer our question. If our random variable has mean mu and variance sigma squared, we can still calculate the expectation and the variance just as usual. But something remarkable happens. Even if we do not know the distribution of x, the distribution of the sampling distribution must still be a normal distribution. This is called the central limit theorem, and this result is true approximately if the sample size n is large. These ideas are the essentials of A-level probability in a nutshell.